real good to be with you, whether you're watching this with us live or if you're watching by video or online, so good to be with you. As we, uh, as we look at, at Christ and we look at specifically at the death of Christ, and we, this is the third week in this series, Jesus, Myth, Madman, or Messiah, and I'm excited uh, for what we're going to experience together today. But I want to start first just with a story uh, of my five-year-old daughter, Andy. Several years ago, obviously she wasn't five, several years ago when she was younger, my wife and I took a trip to California. My sister lives in California. She's living the dream out there in Orange County, Huntington Beach, just uh, having a great time. We had some time off, so the kids got to be with their grandparents, and Amy and I got to go to California and spend a week there. And the kids loved being with their grandparents, but really kind of wanted to go with us. Uh, Jackson really wanted to go, my son, because he heard that in California they have this place called Yogurt Land. And you're kind of familiar with that because we got, you know, Yo Cup and some similar things here now. But at that time, we didn't have anything like that around here. And he had just watched Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And so when he hears Yogurt Land, he thinks that this is like an imaginary land made with yogurt and toppings. And he was bummed that he couldn't come. My daughter, on the other hand, Andy, she really wanted to go just to be with her aunt. She couldn't, she'd never been on a plane before, and she just, Andy is just so excited. It'd be like a dream come true for her to be able to go to California. So from that moment on, she started saving up her money so that she could go to California. And by saving up her money, I mean finding spare change in the couch and then thinking that she had enough to buy a ticket to California. And I love the naivety, but it's pure motives, and you know, she'd find a nickel, yes, dad, come on now, can I go to California? And each time it just didn't reconcile in her mind that she still didn't have enough, you know, no matter how many nickels and pennies she had. Because you know what, if you're searching in a couch for loose change and hoping that that's gonna get you the plane ticket to California, it's just not gonna happen, is it? Like if Andy is ever going to get to California, somebody else is going to have to pay for her to get there. You know what I mean? And I have a feeling that you and I, we're in a similar situation, aren't we? Not that we want to get to California, although that'd be nice. But, but I think on a much deeper level, when we want to reconnect with God, when we want to try to fill that hole, that void, that emptiness that every one of us knows is there, when we want to fill that, when we want to, you know, bridge that gap between us and our creator, we need somebody else to help us with that. Like, we're not going to be able to make that trip on our own. Somebody else needs to pay for us to take that trip. And that's what I want to talk about today, because I want to let you know that somebody else did pay for us to take that trip. But before we get there, like I said... We're moving on in this series. You might want to take out your note sheet there. Jesus, myth, madman, or messiah. We've spent the last two weeks just exploring the historical documentation, the history, the evidence around who this man was and what he did and, and, and what that means for our lives. And so far, we've concluded that, that his story, the gospel accounts, the writings that we have, they're reliable. His impact was undeniable. And his resurrection, that was not rooted in mythology. That is rooted in events that happened in history that were witnessed. And, and so all that evidence points to the fact that Jesus is none other than the Son of God come to rescue us. And so I started thinking, okay, if Jesus is the Son of God, if he is the standard, if he has lived up to what it takes to, to be right in God's eyes, well, then what if you and I, what if we were to compare ourselves with him, right? Because we want to be reconnected with God like Jesus was. We want to have that kind of relationship with God, that kind of purpose and meaning in our lives. So what if we just compare ourselves with Jesus and see how we measure up? Because as I already told you, if we want to get to God, we don't really measure up. We're going to need somebody else to pay that price. And you might expect me now to kind of bring out some Bible verses that would, would say that, would kind of let us know what our plight is like. And I could certainly do that, right? All of the New Testament authors have recognized what's in our hearts, have recognized our depravity, and they wrote about that. But I don't even think that I need to bring you passages of Scripture to say that. I think that, that you can come to that conclusion on your own. Right? We know what's in our hearts. We know who we are when no one else is looking. We know how we respond when the pressure gets turned up. And if we lay that over against Jesus, who lived up to God's standard, 
we're, we're kind of lacking, right? And so let's just do that. On your note sheet there, there's this box, right? And it says there, this is the conclusion that I came to. I have a debt that I could not pay. And I just want to fill this box with some of the things that, that as we compare ourselves with Christ, what do you notice in that comparison? And maybe you're not ready to come to the same conclusion I came to, but let's kind of look at Jesus' life and see what kind of, what, how we measure up. So let's think about how Jesus treated other people, right? How did he treat his friends? How did he treat his enemies? How did he treat the outcasts and the poor and the marginalized and, and the abused in the society, right? And we, and we get those pictures in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament. And then let me compare that with, with how I treat people, right? Even how I treat my friends and how I would treat my enemies, and how I treat people that are hurting. And, and as I start jotting some notes in here, boy, the way that I treat others, boy, I, I certainly don't measure up to how Jesus treated others. I don't make it to that standard. Or what if we move on from there? What if we think about the words that came out of Jesus' mouth, right? The way that he spoke to people, the way that he spoke about people, the truth, the grace, the love, they came out of his lips. And then I compare that with, with my words, even on my best days, are, are sadly lacking, right? The, the vibrancy, the quality, the power, the love, and the grace of Jesus's. So let's move on from there. What if we just looked at Jesus's connection with God, right? His moment to moment, day by day, intimacy with the Father, just walking in step with God's leading, constantly submissive to what God wanted, constantly obedient to God's direction. Man, then I compare that with my own connection with God, which is spotty at best, right? And, and full of a lot more kicking and screaming and, and, you know, running and hiding. And so I jotted some notes down there about that. And then I think about, you know, what Jesus boiled it down for us pretty simply, right? He said, Here, here's what I would love. Love God and love others, right? He says, that, that's going to bring a full life. That's going to give you the kind of life you've always wanted. And I think about how I do in those two seemingly simple commands, and that's pretty bad too, right? And so this picture that I start to get of myself, when I start to compare myself with Christ, this figure that we've looked at for the last couple of weeks, who was historical, who, who did all those things and said all those things, we, we know that that's accurate and reliable. I start to compare myself with that standard. I don't really like how this picture is turning out, right? This is the me that I try to hide from you, right? This isn't who I want to be. But, but this is who I really am. This is what's going on inside. And I have a feeling that if you're doing that same kind of exercise, you're coming to the same conclusion, right? I don't need to tell you what other people say about our depravity, about our sinfulness, because you know, I know, we know what's going on inside. And we know that when we measure up ourselves against Jesus, well, we don't measure up. We fall short. We miss the mark. We come up empty. We are bankrupt. And that's why I've drawn this conclusion here that we have a debt we cannot pay. Right? And I'm not saying that we don't ever do things that are good or honorable or noble. I, I hope that you do. I'm sure that you do. And I hope that that will continue in increasing measure. But let me just tell you, if you are, are relying on those good and noble and honorable things... To, to reconnect you to God, you know what that's like? That's like finding change in the couch and hoping it'll get you to California, right? It's not gonna do it. And even just hypothetically, even if from now on we could live right up to that standard that Jesus set, even if we could do that from this moment on, that, that would do nothing for, for what's already been done, right? The wreckage and the carnage that we've already left in our wake, Friends, we have a debt that we can't pay. And I don't know if you've been following along this with me, but I'd encourage you to jot some things down in, in this box there, right? And nobody's going to see this. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else with this. You can take this home and destroy it. But I, I just want you to get a glimpse, right, of what it looks like if we were to actually put on paper, you know, some of the bankruptcy, some of the regrets, some of the, the things we've said or done that really have led to the most heartache and the most remorse, that brokenness, that darkness that's inside us, right? If we were to capture some of that here, 
I think some of you would look at that and, and you would immediately get the sense that that is going to keep you from God, right? There is just too much there. Even if we just summarize it, there's just too much there for us to bridge that gap, for us to get over that. Some of you are there already. You're ready. You're, you admit, you know, I, I'm bankrupt. I've got, I've, I, I owe a debt that I cannot pay. And yet some of you, I would guess, have a bit of a different conclusion. Like you look at that stuff and you're being honest about it, but I bet some of you would say, yeah, you know, my paper's not clean. My life has not been perfect. I'll admit that, but come on. I mean, is it really that big of a deal? Right, nobody's perfect, right? I was just fooling around, I was young, I made a mistake, it was an accident. You know, for the most part, not too bad, right? Some of you, I, I fear, would say that, and I know that because that's what I used to say, right? I looked at my life up to this point, and you know, granted, it's not perfect, but it's not that bad, is it? I mean, really, it's not, not that big of a deal. I'm not bankrupt, like, I, I, I might be able to pay that debt. Let me try to give you a different perspective on that. Let me try to help you see what that might look like to God. At home, we've got this cuckoo clock. Uh, it's the real deal. It's authentic. Like my wife and I, the first year we were married, had an amazing privilege to actually travel to Germany and spend a summer pastoring a church in Germany. And, uh, and we thought while we were there, you know what, we should bring a little piece of Germany home with us, you know, just to remember this time it was early on in our marriage. And we thought that'd be really neat, kind of a cool memento, a uh, souvenir from this time. So we're shopping in one of these villages in Germany. We go into this shop full of clocks and we're like, oh, perfect. That's it. You know, they make these handcrafted cuckoo clocks. We're like, yeah. So we found our favorite one in the store. We paid more than either of us is used to spending. We had the thing shipped from Germany back to the U.S., put it up at our first apartment. It traveled with us to our second apartment. It traveled with us to the, the home we live in now. It's, it's downstairs in our family room. You know, it's made it all these years. And it's, that's, that's special to us. It's got some, some actual value, and it's got a lot of sentimental value as well. You may not have a cuckoo clock. I'm sure you've got something, though. Right, something that's actually valuable. Right, maybe it's that car. Maybe it's a new car or new to you, or maybe it's just finally paid off. Right, and so that has some value. Or maybe it's the flat screen TV that you, that you really enjoy. Maybe it's those those the, those china dishes that have been handed down, you know, from from your grandma or something like that. I don't know what it is in your house, but I'm sure there are some things that you just like. Right, they're valuable, or at least valuable to you. Now, let's just imagine, totally hypothetically, of course, but let's just imagine that your three-year-old daughter, again, just hypothetically speaking, you know, pulls the chains on the cuckoo clock, brings it off the wall, onto the floor, shatters it into, you know, a million pieces. Hypothetically speaking, of course, right? Because it would be difficult if that really happened. But let's just say that happened, right? Or maybe in your case, you know, your toddler takes, to, you know, uses a stick as the paintbrush and the hood of the car as the canvas, right? Again, just saying it could happen. Or, you know, the Tonka truck, you know, makes, it makes a splash landing in the flat screen TV, right? Or your son perhaps, you know, tackles himself through the china cabinet, destroying every last piece of china. Again, not that any of this has happened, but just saying it could possibly happen, right? So what do you do in that situation? What has to happen in that moment when something like that has been destroyed and been broken? Like, what do you do? How do you communicate the depth of this situation to a toddler? Right? Like, like honey, do you realize like, how expensive that is? Sorry, Daddy. <laughs> you know, you want some change from the couch? <laughs> right? Like, do you... <laughs> Like, there's no way I can explain to you, like, I'd have to go to Germany again, like, back in time and go back and have money, you know. Like, I can't even explain this situation. And I can't make you pay for it, right? Because that means nothing to you, right? That is a debt that, that a toddler cannot pay. That's a debt that a toddler cannot even comprehend. And so all I can do in that situation, all you can do is bring yourself to say, I forgive you, but, but please don't do that again. And I have a feeling that that picture, that's a, a bit of a fuzzy picture 
of what we're dealing with here with God, right? Because we look at the stuff in this box, we look at the stuff in here, and we're like, eh, you know, what's, I'm, I was just fooling around, we were just playing, sorry, you know, can I make it up for you? And yet when God sees that, when he sees the depth of our darkness and our brokenness, he sees so much more than we can ever comprehend. And, and all he can do is say, I, I forgive you, but please don't do that again. For my sake, please don't do that. For your sake, for heaven's sake, please don't keep living like that. And those consequences, I can take care of that. And you're not going to understand why you're not going to understand the depth of what's going on here, and I just can't explain that to you. But, but I forgive you, and I'll take care of it. And if you want to see how God took care of it, take a look at John chapter 19. It's there on your note sheet. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, and they put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received a drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now don't turn over your note sheet just yet, because I, I want to do that together in just a second, but first... I just want you to make the connection here between what's on the top of the note sheet and what's on the bottom of the note sheet. Right? Jesus didn't go through any of that because of anything that he had done. He lived up to God's standard. His paper would be empty. He wasn't paying a price that he owed. He paid the price that I owed. He paid the debt that you were supposed to pay. Right? We destroyed God's masterpiece. We went our own way. We didn't think it was that big of a deal. And yet God says, you know what? I can't even explain this to you in terms you'll understand. But I'll take care of it because I love you. That's why Jesus did that. He paid a debt that we owed. And he did all that so that he could say, now go ahead and turn this over, so that he could say, paid in full. I had a debt I could not pay. He paid the price to take it away. That's why he went to the cross. That's why we call it Good Friday, was because he was paying the debt that we owed. And he says once and for all, that debt, no matter how deep it is, no matter how much you filled in that box, no matter how deep it goes in your heart and how far it goes into the past or how recent it is to this moment, paid in full. Let me tell you why I use that phrase there. Because it's the phrase that Jesus used. I want to spend some time just looking at that final word that Jesus said as he was there on the cross. After he gets that drink, and, and I don't know all the reasons why, but maybe it was so that he could be sure that he could say this loud and clear. But he says one final word. And in English, it looks like three words. It looks like it is finished. But in Greek, and this is what Jesus was speaking, it was just one word. It was the word tetelestai. Let me hear you say tetelestai, tetelestai. That was the Greek word that Jesus said, and, and it was actually a common word 
in, in the Greek language. It was used all the time in the first century. And let me tell you some of the ways that that word was used. It'll give you kind of a fullness of meaning. A servant or an employee would, would use this word. Like if his boss or if his master kind of gave him a job to do, here's what I want you know, next, here's how I want things to be at the house or with the, the, the property or whatever. Maybe he's an employee, employer, and he says, here's how I want things at the shop. And he gives him a job to do. The, the, the servant or the employee would come back when he was done and he would say, to tell us die. I've done what you asked me to do. The job is done. The task is complete. To tell us die. It was a word that artists would use. Like if an artist was working on a painting or a sculpture, right? And after hours of painstaking work and, and pouring their, their creativity and their vision onto this canvas or, or into this, this sculpture, they would step back, right? And they would look at their masterpiece. And you know what they would say? To tell us die. The masterpiece is done, right? This is complete. This is exactly how I want it to be. To tell us die. A soldier would use this word in battle. Like when, when finally the, the tide had shifted and it became obvious that the soldier was on the winning side, that victory was secure, that they had won, a soldier would say, to tell us die. Victory is ours, right? We've won. You, our foes, are finished. So it was a term that soldiers would use. It was a term that a shop owner or a merchant would use. Like if they were giving you a receipt, let's say you paid for something, you, you bought something at the shop, you paid the price that was needed for that, you paid for the ticket to California, right? You would get this receipt back that would say, to tell us die, paid in full. And so when Jesus uses this word, do you know what he's saying? He's saying loud and clear, the task has been done the masterpiece is completed. The victory is won. The debt has been paid. It is finished. To tell us, die. Paid in full. You don't have to keep paying that debt anymore. You don't have to figure out how you're going to get to God anymore. You don't need to try to, you know, undo all that stuff you've done. You don't need to keep trying harder and doing better. The debt has been paid, paid in full. It is finished. To tell us, die. I had a debt I couldn't pay. He paid the price to take it away. And that right there, that is what separates Jesus from every other would-be Messiah out there. This is what separates following Christ from every other religion on the planet before or since. This moment right here. Let me read you a fantastic story about this from the book Radical. The author says, I remember sitting outside a Buddhist temple in the temple grounds the men and the women filled the elaborate, colorful temple grounds where they daily performed their religious rituals. Meanwhile, I was engaged in a conversation with a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader in this particular community. They were discussing how all religions are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. We may have different views about small issues, one of them said, but when it comes right down to it, the essential issues, each of our religions is the same. I listened for a while, and then I asked them, and then, and then they asked me what I thought. I said, it sounds as though you, you both picture God, or whatever you call God, at the top of a mountain. And it seems as if you believe that we are all at the bottom of the mountain, and that I may take one route up the mountain, and you might take another, and in the end, we will all end up in the same place. They smiled as I spoke. Happily, they replied, exactly, you understand. Then I leaned in, and I said, now, let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are? What would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for people to find their way to him, but instead he comes to us? They thought for a moment, and then they responded, that would be great. I replied, let me introduce you to Jesus. This is the gospel. 
as long as you and I understand salvation as a checking off of a box to get to God, we will find ourselves in the meaningless seas of world religions that actually condemn the human race by exalting our supposed ability to get to God. On the other hand, when you and I realize that we are morally evil, dead in sin, and deserving of God's wrath with no way out on our own, we begin to discover our desperate need for Christ. Do you see? It all begins when we are ready to admit that we owe a debt that we cannot pay. There's something inside that's broken and we cannot fix it on our own. And when we're ready to admit that, Jesus stands ready to say, I've already paid that price. I've paid that debt. I've taken that away. All you need to do is accept that. That is what he did on the cross. That is what he meant when he said, it is finished. I had a debt I could not pay. He paid the price to take it away. I love how the Apostle Paul, when he came to understand this, because like you and like me, his slate was not clean. In fact, he, he made a habit of putting Christians to death. He made a habit of, of, of bringing to an end this religious, this, this following after Jesus. But when Jesus met him, when Jesus intersected his life and showed him the depth of his depravity and his bankruptcy, and then invited him into a new life. I love what Paul says when he writes to the, to the believers that were living in Colossae. He says to them, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh and to a Jewish audience, they would understand that. They would know that the, that the people that were uncircumcised, they were outside of God's plan, outside of God's family. You were dead, you were uncircumcised, you were outside of what God desires. When you were in that condition, bankrupt, owing a debt that you could never pay, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having dis disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Our debt has been paid. And here's all we need to do. We first need to admit that we need help. We need to admit that we are bankrupt. We need to admit that we have a debt that we cannot pay. And this is not easy because this takes humility. This takes weakness. This takes our own admission of our own inadequacy. And we have to come to God and admit that we're not worthy to come to him that we've messed up, that we have blood on our hands. But that is where the healing begins. Only then can we, can we get our, our debts paid. Only then can we find the forgiveness and the cleansing that we need when we first admit that we have a debt and then believe that Jesus died to take it away, that his death was for us. When we personalize that, he didn't just die for the world, he didn't just die for everyone in general. He died for you in particular, for the specific junk that you put on that paper or couldn't even bring yourself to. But for the stuff that's in here, that is what put him on the cross, to pay that debt, to satisfy the demands of God's justice for you. When we believe that that was for us, his death not just covers over it, but it washes it away when we admit and we believe. And I'm so glad that so many of you have done that, and I'm so eager for more of you to cross that line. And today may be the day for you to find that new life, for you to finally stop trying to pay, stop trying to earn, stop trying to do, and admit and believe. Come to the cross knowing that it was for you. You had a debt that you cannot pay he paid the price to take it away.